Today's passage is from the book of Ezra, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Ezra 7, 1 through 10. After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sierra, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilakai, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadu, the son of Atom, the son of Amara, the son of Azara, the son of Meroth, the son of Zerahai, the son of Uzi, the son of Bukai, the son of Abishu, the son of Phinephath, the son of Elbazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Aaron came up from Babylon. He was a teacher well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he had asked for. The son, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh day of the year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived, he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. For the gracious hand of God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, and the teaching and decrees in the laws of Israel. Today we're going to meet Ezra. I know we've been in the book of Ezra for four weeks now, but as of yet, Ezra himself has not been a character in this story. The book of Ezra started long before Ezra was born. The book of Ezra began back in 534 B.C. when King Cyrus of Persia made a decree that the Israelites could return to their homeland. And we pick up the story today, 94 years have passed since those first settlers have returned to Jerusalem and started to work on the temple. And today we finally meet Ezra. Ezra will, will return to Jerusalem to work on the temple. Now, as Ezra introduces himself, he starts by talking about himself in the third person, saying Ezra arrived in Jerusalem on this year and this month. By the next chapter, he'll start talking about himself in the first person, saying, I did this or that. And in this introduction, we're told a few things about Ezra. And the first thing I'll mention that we learn about Ezra is his job. The NIV says that he was a teacher. And I understand why the NIV translates it that way, but probably not the best word here. It would be more accurate to say that Ezra was a scribe. What do you think about when you hear the word scribe? The definition is a person who makes copies of documents. I mean, that seems accurate. When I think of the word scribe, I think of a, a copyist. It was... The ancient world's version of a guy who works at Kinko's. Nothing against that. I mean, I have had much worse jobs than working at Kinko's. But I don't tend to think of a guy who works at Kinko's as a, a mover and shaker. And they're not changing the world with online printing and crisp color copies. Again, nothing wrong with working at Kinko's, but that's not the seat of power. And for a long time, that's what a scribe was. In Israel, a scribe was a guy who made copies of things. He wrote things down. Scribes tended to be more educated than most people, but they didn't have to be. Many scribes couldn't read or write. You don't need to be able to read words in order to copy them. So a scribe was basically just a copyist. Ezra changed that. From the time of Ezra on, scribes would become much more important, on through the days of Jesus. You may have noticed this in the New Testament. The scribes were seen as really important people. They were some of Jesus' biggest opponents. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus was challenged by the Pharisees, the religious leaders. He was challenged by the Sadducees, the political leaders. And he was challenged by the scribes, 
and the teachers of the law. How this happened, how could a scribe, a guy who writes things down, become so important that he was seen as fit to challenge Jesus? Well, it was Ezra. He created this change. Ezra changed what it meant to be a scribe for centuries to come. So today I want to start to look at Ezra. Talk about the kind of person who could bring this kind of change. Because Ezra changed what it meant to be a scribe, partly by what he did, but it started with who he was. So in today's passage, in this introduction to Ezra, I want to learn four things about Ezra. I want to learn, I want to look at these four characteristics of Ezra and how he could bring about this big change. Now, passage in Ezra begins with a list of names. I hate the list of names. <laughs> I really do. They come up a lot in the Old Testament, and it just hurts. It, it saw me up there a few moments ago reading through that list of names. I practice those. I do. Beforehand, I go through it. I try to figure out how you say all those names. And I still feel like I just stumble through them. And yet the first five verses are nothing but a list of names. I'm not going to go through them all again. It's just too painful. But I'll say that Ezra began with his own name and then his father, Sariah. And then there are 17 generations listed in those five verses. But what really matters is the last one. Ezra used this passage to draw a line from him back to Aaron the brother of Moses, the first high priest in Israel. That's the point of that list of names. Ezra was trying to establish that he was a Levite, that he was part of the priestly family, that he was born a priest in the line of the high priests. I, I like living in the age of the New Covenant. I do, for a lot of reasons. The name of Jesus has been revealed to us. The salvation by faith and not by works has made, been fully explained. The Holy Spirit lives within us to empower us and guide us. One of the reasons I like living in the age of the New Covenant is a doctrine we call the priesthood of all believers. Over in the book of 1 Peter, Peter wrote, You also, like living stones, are being built to a spiritual house and a royal priesthood. In Ezra's day, to be a priest, you had to be born a priest. This was a status conferred on Ezra by birth. There's no other way to become a priest in ancient Israel. In our day, Jesus has changed all of that. He has made us a royal priesthood. When we come to Christ, we become priests of the Most High God. We no longer need any other priest. We don't need a priest as a mediator between us and God because God himself, the person of Jesus Christ, is our mediator. We don't need a new priest to teach us about the Lord because we have the Holy Spirit living in us to guide us in the ways of the Lord. We don't need a priest to perform sacrifices for us because we are living sacrifices ourselves. We have become a royal priesthood by the grace of God. Now, in Ezra's day, being a priest mattered. Ezra needed to establish that he was a priest. We just need to realize that we are priests. Ezra needed to establish that he was a priest to show his authority in Israel, that he was from the line of high priests, and he was born into that family. For us, it's not the physical birth that matters, but the spiritual birth, their se our second birth. For we are born again as priests. And now we don't need to establish that because God's already done it. We just need to realize the truth so that we can experience the power of God in our lives. 
So that's where Ezra began. He began by establishing that he was from the line of Aaron, a priest of Israel. And then Ezra tells us a few more things about himself. He tells us three more things, and they all relate to the word of God. Ezra says that he devoted himself to the, to the law of the Lord and to observing it and to teaching it in Israel. There's three things in there, and I want to talk about each of them. The next thing we're told about Ezra first is that he devoted himself to the law of the Lord. He devoted himself to knowing God's law. Now, the first thing I want to say here is that the law was all Ezra had. All he had was those list of rules, the laws, the statutes that God handed out. And so he devoted himself to those laws. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, I like living in the age of the new covenant. I like it because we have more than just a list of rules. We have a full revelation in Jesus Christ. So it's more than just these rules. It, we know we're not saved by the rules. That was true in Ezra's day as well. Salvation doesn't come by obeying the law. There's no law that has ever been written that can bring life. It's always been the case. Paul made a big deal about this in a couple of his letters. Pointing that if you go back to Abraham, before the law was even written down, salvation came by faith. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. But... In Ezra's day, they were expected to keep the law. All of it. They were expected to keep all these rules and regulations. Not just doing what's right. Not just good works, as we are called to do. But the sacrifices and the ceremonies and all the stuff that Jesus has already fulfilled for us. But that's what Ezra had. He had the list of rules. And so he devoted himself to the law of the Lord. If Ezra devoted himself to the law of the Lord, when all he had was a list of rules. How much more should we devote ourselves to the word of God now that we have the full revelation in Jesus Christ? Ezra devoted himself to the law when all he had was a shadow of the truth. Now that we have the full truth of God, we should be far more devoted to his word. But we have to actually devote ourselves. We have to choose that devotion. Because if we don't, other things are going to distract us. I think about the things in our lives that distract us from the Word of God. Now, that's talking about the necessities of life. You know, we all have to go to work. We all have to, or just go to school, maybe, or take care of the kids, or cook supper. You know, those are things that we have to do in life. I'm talking about the things that just steal our time. Not necessarily bad things. I mean, certainly, there's, there's that. There is sin. There's no worse waste of time than sin. But what I'm telling you about here is not things that are necessarily sinful. They just take our time away. I think for our society, TV has got to be way up there. We waste a lot of time in TV. Or for a younger generation, it may be more video games, which is kind of the same thing. Or then there's social media. Uh, average American spends two hours a day on social media of some kind. And those things aren't wrong. There's nothing bad about it. There's nothing wrong with sitting down and watching a television show that you enjoy. But how often do you sit down and just flip through the channels? How often have you watched a TV show that you honestly did not enjoy? Or just scanned through YouTube videos with no real goal? How often have you scrolled through your Facebook page and not cared about what you saw? That's the thing that just steal our time. And if we're not devoted to the word of the Lord, that's what happens to us. The things we don't care about steal our lives away. And the more it goes, the easier it gets. As one Christian writer put it, when the devil first tries to tempt you out of God's word, he'll have to actually tempt you with something you want. He might tempt you out of God's word by tempting you to read a good book that you really enjoy. But once he's got you out of God's word, it becomes a lot easier. He doesn't need to tempt you with a good book. The ingredients on a box of cereal will work. When we lose that devotion to God's word, the things we don't 
care about steal our lives from us. Ezra was devoted to God's law. Then we, we learn another truth about Ezra. Next thing we're told about Ezra, first he was devoted to God's law, second he was devoting to observing God's law. He didn't just read it, he obeyed it. Saying that I can't help but think about James chapter 1, verse 22, which says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. James compares someone who reads the word and doesn't obey it to a person who looks in the mirror and immediately forgets what he looked like. I think the point for James there was that if you're going to forget what you look like, why bother looking in the mirror? You could have just not looked in the mirror at all because it's not going to affect you in any way if you forget what you look like. The same way, if you're not going to obey the Word of God, why are you trying to read it? If it's not going to affect your life, you might as well read those ingredients on the cereal box. Because if neither one's going to have any impact, it doesn't matter. So when we read the Word of God. Don't just read it. Put it into practice. Now, this is not about salvation. We're not, not saying you have to keep the law in order to be saved. We are saved by the grace of God alone in Jesus Christ. This is about living a changed life. This is about living a life that changes those around us. If we're going to live that kind of life, if we're going to be that kind of change, we can't just read the Word we need to put it into practice. Ezra did that. Ezra was devoted to the law of the Lord, and he was devoted to obeying the law of the Lord. Then we learned, final thing, third, third thing, starting the law, the fourth thing we learned about Ezra. He was devoted to teaching the law of the Lord. So I imagine, as I say that, there are at least a few people out there who think, all right, this one doesn't apply to me. You got all that other stuff I got to do, but you, I'm not a free teacher. You know, Brian, you're a teacher. You, you go do that. The, the elders, Paul, Curtis, Tom, you guys are teachers. You, you've got to do this. I don't teach. I, I can zone out for this part. I understand that mindset. I, I do. I, I can get it. Uh, James said in James 3.1, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because we know that those who teach will be judged more Strictly. I don't know if James was saying that we'll be judged more strictly by God, if we'll be judged more strictly by other people. But if we're going to be teachers, then we need to walk the walk. We will be judged more strictly. So if you're going to tell someone else how to live, you need to live that way yourself first. Okay, so I get the attitude of not wanting to be a teacher. I hope I haven't just scared you off with what I just said. Because we are all teachers. You might not be a teacher in the way that the elders of the church are teachers, but you are called to teach. Because if you sit down and have a conversation about God with your friend, with a co-worker, with just some random person you meet on at a park bench, you become a teacher of God's word. Any time that you talk to someone else about the Lord, you become their teacher. If we're going to do that, we need to be devoted to it. Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. If we're going to do that, then we need to be devoted to teaching. Now, obviously, this is a different kind of teaching. It's not teaching like what I'm doing right now. You probably, no, I hope you know, I'm not just making stuff up right now. And I don't stand up here and say just whatever comes to my head and, hey, it just happens to fit with what's on the screen. What a good coincidence. That's not happening. I obviously have prayed about this, thought about this, and prepared what I'm going to say to things. Can't do that if you just sit down for a conversation. If you, you don't know when that conversation is coming. You don't know what questions that person is going to have. You don't know what experiences, what baggage that person is bringing with them. So this is a different kind of teaching. This isn't the kind of teaching where you write out a lesson plan. It's the kind of teaching that only can happen by being devoted to the Word of God. 
It's when we are devoted to God's word that we know what God has said, that we are experiencing it by obeying what it says, that that allows us then to be this kind of teacher. It is the Holy Spirit who lives within us and who gives us the words to speak when we need them. But that only happens when we are devoted to the word. First, we have to be in the word that allows us to be teachers. And Ezra was a teacher. He was devoted to the law of the Lord. He was devoted to obeying it. He was devoted to teaching it. I have two last things I want to say to talk about teaching. I'm going to use this to kind of close today's sermon. One is that if you are a parent, you are a teacher. Your kids are learning from you. If you're a grandparent, then you are a teacher. Your children are learning from you. The number one indicator, if a child will have faith later in life, now, across the board, if we're talking about personal faith, church attendance, charity, whatever it is, number one indicator is the faith of their parents. What their parents do is what the children will grow up to do. Proverbs says if you train a child in what is right, and when he is older, he will not depart from it. Your children are learning from you. They learn what is important by seeing what you do. They learn what is not important by seeing what you do not do. It's not from what you say, it's from watching what you do. And you will be judged more strictly because you'll be judged by your kids that they are going to imitate everything you do. So we are called to be teachers. If you are a parent or a grandparent, you are a teacher. Last thing I'll say, close this sermon. It's talking about a kind of teaching I've talked about several times over the last couple of years. I'm going to bring it up again. It's the idea of choosing one. Choose one person you know who does not know the Lord, whom you care about, you desire to see them come to faith. And pray for that person every day. Some days pray in depth, bringing their name before the Lord. Sometimes just, some days just mention them. Just mention their name to God, but every day, bring them before God. And if you make that commitment, then you are committing to be their teacher. You are committing to be there to answer questions when they have them. You are committing to be there to explain the reason for the hope that you have. You are committing to know the word enough that you can be their teacher. If you care about this person, if you desire this person to come to the Lord then that requires a commitment to be their teacher. You're probably not going to change the world through this. You're not going to redefine a profession for generations to come the way that Ezra did. But you might change a life. You might change the world for one person, change them from a world of meaninglessness to a world of hope. Change them from being lost to being found. To do that, we need to be devoted to God's word. We need to be devoted to knowing God's word, to obeying it, and to teaching it. And when we do that, then God changes us. The moment we're going to stand for invitation. And as we stand to sing, if you need that devotion, you look at your right life and say, man, I'm defined by anything but devotion. I've been letting these distractions steal it from me. And you want to see a change. If you desire to make your first commitment to Christ, if you desire to make a new commitment to Christ, you have that opportunity. This week, talk to myself, talk to one of the elders, or even right now, if you need to make that commitment, you have a chance. I ask you stand with me for our invitation hymn. Just pass me not, and we will sing just the first verse. Mm -hmm.